So, Mark, did you see that video of the helicopter dropping the big flag on the Statue of Liberty at New York, New York for the F1 race? I have a big question. What if they missed the coasters going by? This looks very dangerous. Yeah, what happened? I mean, what happens if the wind picks up? It could end up on the coaster. I don't know that it was the smartest thing to do. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, I don't know. It, you know, I wouldn't want to be on that coaster as long as that thing's up there. Maybe they pulled it down right after. You know, half the people are going to be really mad about this thing. Why could they possibly be upset? Because half of them are going to think it's the real one in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty twenty four is the year of golf in Las Vegas, and we've had so many venues open up. We have Atomic Golf, we have Pop Stroke, we have all of these, and Swingers is the last one opening on November eighth at Mandalay Bay. And we have some more information about the pricing, and I guess we'll just put it out there. Starting at thirty dollars a round, and uh, yeah, the tickets are on sale now. You get access. They have all these different packages that include drinks, the carnival, so you can really kind of pick your pleasure, but 30 bucks is about as cheap as you're going to get. Yeah, I would uh, pay attention to the drink prices because the drink pack package says up to $21. If you're not maximizing that, like if you're just drinking a beer or something, probably best not to get the package with it baked in. But if you're getting like a mixed drink that's $21, you save five bucks on the two drink package type of thing. So just figure that out. Usually probably better just to pay for your drinks separate. Uh, it sounds like kind of cool, like they're going to have like a golf cart or a, a beverage cart come around for people that are doing it. I just wonder how well it will do. We've seen Atomic Golf struggle. I haven't heard, a, a, you know, Pop Stroke, how that's going. But we talked about being outside in the heat and everything. That's a deterrent. Maybe this being indoors is a bit better. But 30 bucks for Putt-Putt is kind of crazy when it doesn't come with a drink or anything else. I, I don't know. Maybe the atmosphere will be cool enough that it will draw people in. You're already at the end of the strip, which is tough. I don't know. I, I have my doubts. I, I think it looks great. I think it, it's a fun concept. I just don't know how well it will do. So I looked at the more expensive dates on the weekends. It was 35 so it doesn't jump up too much for that. But the other big piece of news here is the pizza coming there. Detroit pizza from New York, I guess. Emmy Squared Pizza, which is apparently famous, is Detroit-style pizza from Brooklyn, and it's going to be housed in Swingers. So a unique sort of pizza thing, not just New York-style pizza there. Yeah, it looks like it's grandma style, which is a New York thing, Sicilian type thing, and, and a mix of that and Detroit style. It looks really good. I've never had it, uh, but it looks pretty tasty. So it all, I mean, it all depends on what the cheese is like, what the sauce is like, all that stuff. But from the looks of it, I give it, you know, like a nine out of 10. So yeah, always good to see new pizza coming to the strip. Good pizza from elsewhere. So we'll keep an eye on that as it opens pretty soon. Another big story this week, Aer Lingus uh, launched their inaugural flight from Dublin to Las Vegas. They were all over the sphere. I was driving around the strip the other day and that Aer Lingus ad was running all day long. And uh, yeah, people like to say the name of this airline for some reason. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, you know, we're award people. I'm thinking of it from that perspective, going either way, either people from the West Coast wanting to go to Europe or people from Europe wanting to come to Vegas. It, you know, you avoid all those taxes and fees of flying into London. So I think it will be a popular route. I think it'll do pretty well. I think even if you live in London, it might make sense, you know, to fly over there and then fly into Vegas, especially if you're using award bookings or anything like that. What's cool about Dublin too, is they have pre-clearance. So if you fly to Vegas from Dublin, you do all this, all the customs, everything in Dublin, you just arrive like it's a domestic flight. They are the 19th international carrier to Las Vegas and Dublin is the 20th international destination, the eighth overseas destination. So more growth here. We need more overseas flights, so I'm really excited about this. Another option for Europe. Good options for mileage sometimes, too. And, yeah, I've never flown them, but I know a lot of people love this airline. Yeah, we did it from Boston once, and we've just missed out when it was 25K in business class, lie flat over uh, uh, from Boston, and it went up to 50K. That was kind of a sad day. Avios keep going up from there, but it, it was a good experience. I think it was solid, you know, nothing super. The flight attendants were great. The product was really nice and clean. And, uh, you know, the seat was comfortable and everything. So I, I would fly them again for sure. So one of the big debates in Las Vegas or Nevada in general is, are you a native Nevadan? And for people like me who came here when they were a kid and have lived here for 30 years, it's a little offensive to say I'm not a native Nevadan when a little 10-year-old brat who was born here is. But uh, the city of Las Vegas released this interesting map that shows which areas of town have the most native-born Nevadans. 
And you can see on like the east side, Sunrise Mountain, some of the older areas of town, you have a lot more native Nevadans. The richer areas of town like Summerlin and up in Anthem and stuff like that, you have a lot less native born Nevadans. And I just found it interesting to kind of look at. We need a map of Californians, like we, we, <laughs> native Californians living in the area. I bet you it, it probably hit higher rates in some spots. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of California. You probably overlay it. It's uh, if you did between native Nevadans and Californians, it's probably pretty high to the top. But yeah, it's just interesting how everything is sort of settled out. And you can see some big differences between areas that only have 10 percent versus areas that have 40 percent or more. Obviously, the newer areas are going to have a lot more transplants. The older areas, people have lived there forever and they're sticking around and. They don't like all these newfangled Las Vegans. Yeah, and all the people that get pissed that a guy from Detroit talks about Vegas. None of you from there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is either the marketing brilliance of the year or it's annoying as hell, but the Neon City Festival has decided that they're going to release a new aspect of this festival every single week until it happens. So we're not getting all of the headliners. We're not getting all of the details. But this week they added a couple other Big bands, All American Rejects and Plain White Tees, definitely going after our 90s nostalgia here. And uh, they also released a schedule of where everybody's playing on what days so you can see which bands you can see on which stage. And uh, four stages going for this. And yeah, it looks cool. But next week we'll find out more and then the week after more. And I guess uh, we'll decide if we keep covering it. Yeah, I really like, you know, that they broke this down. The stage, each stage on each day has, you know, a, a certain type of music. It's not like a big mosh up of of different genres so I, I like that that they did it that way it kind of gives a unique feel if you want alternative rock you go here if you want edc you, do, you go here you know emo type stuff or heavy metal you go here on this day so i like that they grouped it together like that and kind of broke it up between the four stages made it easy to get to what you want to hear and you don't have to listen to maybe something else that's kind of mixed in that isn't your your vibe so i think they're doing a good job with this so far you know, we made jokes when it first came out, and then the headliner got kicked off the, <laughs> the thing. So uh, they replaced it with some people, you know, if you grew up in around our age, probably 35 to 55, somewhere in that range, you know a lot of these these bands, so you can be excited for it. And, it, you know, hopefully it brings people down to the area. I think they still have one or two other acts that are blurred out on their, uh, on their poster, so we'll see whatever else uh, comes. But it is bigger than we thought it was, and they are getting some good stuff going there, and I do think this is a great companion to F1 on the strip. And, you know, the vision is sort of kind of rounding out, even if it's taking them a little time. They are putting this together sort of last minute. So kudos to them on that as well. It's not like they had this planned from a year ago. They really are trying to throw this together. Yeah. And then if they keep if it's successful and they keep it going next year, I'm sure it'll get better and better and bigger and bigger names as, as they have time to plan for it and everything. One other thing I came across when doing research for today's show was this article that said F1 is thinking about canceling after two years on the strip. It seems to be sourced from like somebody's blog post. And so, yeah, I don't think that that's credible in any way. So we're not going to cover that other than to say that people are still talking all that nonsense. I'm pretty sure three years at least. So we got at least a year to go of this and. We should wish it a success. It hasn't been as painful. Boys to men, Mark. Boys to men. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're going into it hasn't been as painful. And then you're like, you know what? Screw it. Let's just talk about boys to men. Uh, it, no, it would be really interesting. And, you know, coming up to year three, because I think that there is a decent chance that it pulls out. If this goes fairly well and they make enough money, I'm sure they'll they'll keep it going, you know, up to the 10 year mark or whatever it was. If this is kind of a mess again and people don't really dig it, I think, uh, you know, it could be year three. They might say, you know what, enough's enough. Let's move on. Speaking of moving on, the downtown cocktail room is closing after 18 years. This feels like one of those venues that was the early transition of East Fremont and that whole area, the downtown project, everything like that. But after 18 years, they are closing their doors. We don't know what's going to replace it. We don't really know why. Maybe redevelopment. A lot of that land's been sold recently as the Tony Shea estate gets sort of sold off. So we don't really know the details. But downtown cocktail room going away forever. Yeah, I have to imagine it was something with the lease coming up or they lost, you know, lost the building or the building got purchased uh, type of thing because it has always been successful. Everybody seems to love it that I've ever talked to has enjoyed it. And like you said, it was like the original thing that you would leave Fremont street experience and actually cross that street. Cause it used to be sketchy, you know, not too long ago and it was a bit rough. There was that, and it's kind of grown up from there. And now it's one of the cooler places to go hang out. So I think they were a big part of that and sad to see them go. 
As a reminder, we have our Patreon. $5 a month gets you access to our weekly after show every single week behind the channel, more Vegas, all of that good stuff helps to support us to make more content. Patreon.com forward slash MTM Vegas for all the information. Thanks to everybody who supports us over there. So this could have been an intro to the show, but I don't know. I just threw it in here. This guy button slapping. Did you see this video of the slot machine? And he's almost like playing the piano in the way that he's doing patterns and tapping. And this is an art. I, I guess. I, I, yeah, it's weird. And I think all these people know that it doesn't actually help. Maybe maybe some don't. But it's kind of funny to see this. Usually we see it like on the screen. Button slapping seems more of like a, a pastime when there wasn't screen interactions as much. But I feel like this is worse than banging on the screen because you can mess up these buttons that they don't work for the people properly and maybe that person wants to have a royal flush and they hold them and hit the button and it doesn't hold them i don't know but and a throwback to whenever that story was like three months ago i don't know you think that the security would come over and say something wouldn't you no however people get their kicks i think that you just let people do it but i mean he's like playing the piano it's a there's no sound but people can go watch it and listen and it's beautiful it's music to your ears there's no sound but they can he... go listen well, they can go watch the video. There's no sound on our video, but they can go watch yeah. the original video okay. so you can get all of the musical yeah. notes from his uh, from his tapping. Yeah, I don't know. I don't get it, but, you know, people having fun in their own ways. Yeah, as long as the machine's not harmed, you know, who cares? But I, I don't know. Has that ever happened where somebody's smashed a button so hard it broke the machine? I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has, and we all go to machines and the buttons are broken. So, you know, those are the people doing it. But I'm or sure sticky. somebody smashed the glass behind the buttons and all kinds of stuff. I'm sure everything that can be broken on a slot machine has been. So all over my X feed this week has been this Golden Knights Zamboni bucket uh, for chicken strips. I don't know how many different places I see it. You even saw it and sent it in, and I saw it probably four or five different places. So I guess this is new this year for the Golden Knights. Apparently other places have this. I mean, it's not super unique, but it's cool. And I think it's like 28 bucks for the chicken strips and fries. You keep the Zamboni. I don't know why it's so cool, but it's cool. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool. And I mean, chicken or chicken tenders and fries are usually 12, 15 bucks at the game anyway. So you're paying a bit more, uh, but you get this cool thing. And especially if you have kids at home or something, or if you just have like a, a sports place that you want to hang it up or, you know, a basement that you hang out and watch the games. I think it's kind of uh, something cool to add to it. And I know my kids, if my kids were like six or seven still, they would have loved that thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's neat. And the fact that it's all over social media uh, shows that people love it. So go Knights, go early in the season. But they've done pretty good at home, struggling on the road. Let's hope uh, we can get our championship back to Vegas. Hockey town, where it belongs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> over to Caesars Palace now. And we Cleopatra's Barge closed years ago. And now we know it's been redeveloped into a bar space and vital vegas was over there this week showed us pictures of what it looks like now it's going to be known as caspian's lounge and this is going to be more of a lounge so not really performance space they may have a band or something in there it's kind of sad to see it in this condition cleopatra's barge was such a cool venue i still don't understand why they had to do this i mean i've walked by it a ton and it always looked cool and it draws your eyes i just never really saw a ton of people in there but that you know usually earlier in the night Maybe it wasn't fully going yet. It always drew you in and looked like a place that you want to go hang out. And, you know, it was beautiful. And now you see this and it just looks like any other boring space. And I know that they're going to make it better, but it looks tight. It looks way smaller than it used to. It's weird. It's like they made it worse by redoing it somehow. I, I don't know. I mean, if you were going to convert it, you couldn't leave the barge in the water. Come on. I mean, that's such a unique thing to create like another ultra lounge modern thing. I don't know. But we'll see how it looks. We don't really know everything yet the other thing at caesar's palace there's a lot going on with construction there we've talked their poker room closed for renovation they're putting in new high limit slot rooms but they also renovated their old high limit slot room and vital vegas shared pictures of that as well and they've mimicked the lighting from the pit of the old casino which looks really neat so this looks great and then even more high limit slots coming to caesar's very soon a lot of changes going on at the flagship yeah the most confusing property in vegas by far i, I get lost i still get lost every time i'm in there but no, it's cool that they, you know, used the ceiling, made it look similar to the main area and everything. It looks good. It looks like a slot area. Yeah, even more confusing when they add more high limit slots. So then you'll have multiple areas to go to yeah. uh, all of that. It's uh, a confusing place, but we love it. Caesar's Palace for the world. It's funny. Paris shared on social media views from their balconies the other day. 
And so they have this beautiful view going out as you see the balcony, but they don't want to show the Bellagio fountains because they don't own them. So they just turn the camera towards Caesar's Palace. So they're like, you got this incredible balcony view of Caesar's <laughs> Palace. Yeah, I mean, the original fountains of Vegas, right? You got to take those in. But yeah, everybody's buying those rooms for the Bellagio fountains. You know, not doing it is just a disservice to yourself not showing it because people aren't going to be, oh, I can look at Caesars, but maybe they don't realize they can look at Bellagio too from there. No free advertising for Bellagio, I guess, uh, is the is the thing there. But I was on the Strip this week or around the Strip. I went to Hofbrau House for a friend's dinner. I hadn't been to Hofbrau House in probably 10 years. And for people who don't know, this is a beer garden. And Hofbrau House, the original one in Munich, I think dates back to the 1500s. I've been there. It's super cool. The one here is kind of touristy, but I've had good experiences there. Unfortunately, like the service was just terrible. The waitress was weird and rude. And I don't know, the beers are twenty eight fifty for a liter of beer. Everything's kind of overpriced there. That is not a surprise, but... Yeah, at one point she brought me, I ordered a non-alcoholic beer and she brought me another one, which I never ordered. And it just sort of sat there. And then I told her that and she accused me of lying that I ordered it and all these weird things going on. But the atmosphere in there is so cool. They have like the fake daytime. You're in a beer garden. They have bands going in there. So I think it's worth it for the novelty of going in Hofbrau House. But I don't know. I've never had great food there. And the service this time left a lot to be desired. Yeah, I think it's like a go for one beer type of place or, you know, just kind of hang out and take in the sites. Or if you've gone to Hofbrau House's other places and you want to see what the one in Vegas is like. But, I, it, yeah, I wouldn't make like a, a dinner spot for myself. You, you know, it's just kind of like grab a beer, but it's going to cost you and, and kind of take in the music and everything and, and be on your way. Yeah, and we had the schnitzel and I had the chicken cutlet sandwich, which was pretty good. My friend had the currywurst. The food is decent. It's German food. So if you like that. Uh, it's going to be good. And you do get the atmosphere there. I, the service just, that was really the the sad part of it. And that really goes down to the server. But I do love the atmosphere. The prices are a little insane, but the building's unique. And that place has been going strong forever. So kudos to them for that on that corner and uh, really uh, enjoyed that. Also afterwards went to Silver Stamp, our favorite neighborhood dive bar. And man, do I love that place. So I went there last year. I think we went there. There was Christmas decorations. I've been there during the normal time. This was my first time for Halloween. Of course, they do Halloween right with all kinds of scares and jumps and decorations and the bartenders are friendly. I did notice the prices were a little higher than I remember, like 12 bucks for a beer. We're starting to push it, you know, as the arts district becomes more popular. But I just wish that place was right down the street from my house. I'd hang out there all the time. Yeah, it's such a cool atmosphere. And it just feels like a bar that you would find in any, you know, local watering hole across the country, especially like a Midwestern type of bar which i think makes it a bit unique for vegas and something you don't see much you know it's very uh, mostly trendy bars and stuff but arts just districts gives you more of that vibe and more uh, variety among their bars so and that's a favorite of mine i'm sad to see the prices go up but i'm sure rent's going up and everything else uh, so i can't blame them too much i mean if you want cheap beer you go to the beer machine at uh the sand dollar right and you get your five dollar mystery beer yeah exactly so i mean I, i'm not complaining about the prices at silver stamp it's all good i just sort of pointing it out it is what it is but that place is special and i love it it's a beer bar there's no liquor there. There's no machines. So it's just like you say, it really does feel like it's from a different place. You don't have all of the aspects that you normally have uh, at a Vegas bar and Halloween done right. We stopped in at the sand dollar. It was so packed and crowded. That's when we went over to silver stamp. So I don't know. We were reliving our last December, uh, Dave and I uh, with you, but it turned out to be great. I love those types of places and sand dollar. I didn't get any video, but it was packed because there was like a Halloween concert. Got to get back for the oh, great cool. dead band. So I'm going to look up when they're playing and go and do my dancing. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a fun night. And if you if you've never been and you're going to Vegas, and you want to try something different, a, a bit off the beaten path, I, I definitely recommend it. And let's close with this. On the last show, we talked about Sahara's poker room closing and not quite sure what they were going to put there. And uh, the answer is slots. They're going to put slots there. Not very exciting. Until you read into it a little bit more, and the Review Journal had an article about it saying that the poker room is going to be replaced with a new concept area for slot machines. It's going to debut in mid-December, and it's going to have dedicated slot banks where players can be some of the first to play like the hottest new games, test games, things like that. So I don't know. I think this is just going to be like a marketed area for brand new slot machines coming to the market. I don't think they're doing any real testing or anything, but... That's what it's going to be. I know they make it sound kind of interesting, though. They make it sound like, oh, we're going to have something that nobody else has, something completely unique and different. And I'm like, oh, OK, that sounds good. I still wish they would have turned it into a lounge or 
or maybe like a, a table area, table game area, something like that. I think it would have been a better use of the space. Slot is just a slot. But if they do come out with something unique or something we haven't seen somewhere else, you know, I think that would be pretty awesome on their part and, and give you a reason to go there. I always find these marketing partnerships between the gaming companies and the casinos interesting. So I wonder if it's going to be one of those. I don't know if I have video of it, but like the Silverton has their Buffalo themed room, which only has Buffalo slots. They have a Dragon Cash theme room. So clearly there is a marketing thing going on between them and, you know, the manufacturer aristocrat. So we'll see how this goes, but I'm guessing it's going to be one of those, you know, marketing with it to get like a hot new game and put them all right there. But maybe it will be something experimental where they can get people's feedback. And, you know, we talked about how things have felt a little stagnant. Not everybody's loving the current state of slot machines, especially how fast they all take your money. Yeah. Yeah, bonus or bust. Uh, no, yeah, I hope they do something. So let us know what you guys think about anything we talked about today. Nevadans that were born here, does that make it native or am I a native Nevadan? I'll just say I am. Uh, the slot machines at Sahara, F1 dropping that flag, was that dangerous to do? Everything else we talked about, so many weird topics today. Leave a comment. We do two shows a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. We'll be back in a couple days with another show. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to you next time. If you've been arrested for playing slots at five years old, I think that that makes you a local. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty.